Hey guys, welcome to a new video lecture. Uh, this one's going to be a little different because we are not dealing with ancient history. Uh, it might feel old to you, but we're actually jumping into the early 19th century, which is only about 200 years ago. So uh, I know that seems very old, but when you compare it to the stuff that we've been doing with the Roman Empire and stuff, this is relatively contemporary or modern. Um, so our question is, were factories bad for the health of English workers? So we're focusing on whether factories were detrimental to people's health or not. Was it safe? Was it not? And we're doing this in England. Now, when we were doing our ancient civilizations, England didn't really exist. I mean, the land was there, but it doesn't really become England until really the middle of the Middle Ages. However, by this time, England is part of Britain, Great Britain, uh, which is the biggest empire in the world. And they are going to bring factories specifically to London to mass produce goods. Um, factories, that's what they do. They hire people. They say, you glue this together. You put this here. You stick this. In. I'm pointing to my microphone, obviously. And they hire these people um, to do one little job to make something. Whereas, you know, if you... If you wanted a chair before the factory system, you had to hire a carpenter. You had to hire an artisan, and that person knows how to make that chair from start to finish. Today, if you buy a chair, guarantee you it's made in a factory. And it's not made by a chair maker. This person puts the legs on. This person puts the cushion on. This person glues it together. Whatever. It's, it's done by different people, if not machines. So... These factories spring up all over England, Manchester, Liverpool, London. Were they bad for the health of English workers? Were they safe? Well, I can tell you that in lots of novels in England uh, throughout the 19th century, one of the things they talk about is the dour London sky, the soot, the dirt that came out of these factories and you know, cast a shadow, cast a big cloud over London, which is notoriously not very sunny. Um, but did it affect people's health? Well, that's what we're going to do today. Okay, so read this little excerpt here with me. Throughout the first half of the 19th century, England debated and passed a number of laws regulating work hours and conditions in factories. Okay, so England's government... Parliament, by the way, that's like Congress for us. They call it Parliament, and it works a little bit differently. They debate about the laws and how they should regulate working hours and factories. Like, okay, what's a safe factory to work in? How many hours should these people work there? We have similar labor laws today. Like, you can't force someone to work more than 40 hours a week without paying them overtime. People have the right to work in a safe environment, not in a place that will um, hurt them. Many of these laws focused on protecting children working in factories and set limits on the amount of hours that children could work in factories. The Factory Act of 1850, for example, limited the weekly hours that children can work to 60 and daily hours to 10 and a half. Now that is way lower than it is today, so just keep that in mind. And again, we're talking about children, we're not even talking about adults. Throughout this period, several commissions were established to gather information on working conditions in factories. Further, many politicians, academics, doctors, and other public figures wrote books, pamphlets, speeches, and newspapers, newspaper articles supporting or opposing regulation of the country's growing factory system. So what that means is we had people from all over England, and sometimes outside of England, saying, you know, we should regulate factories more, we should have more rules with factories, and other people saying, no, nah, you don't need those rules. You know, the factories work fine without them. You're, you're, you're getting worried over nothing. So today our jobs to explore some historical documents to address the question, were textile factories, but all factories, bad for the health of English workers? Okay, so let's take a look at some of our documents, and as we do every time, we're going to look at the background of the document first before we actually read anything. Why do we do that? We need to know the context. We need to know who's writing. What's their angle? What are they trying to get at? Well, we can do that uh, by looking at the bottom. So the bottom says, House of Lords Committee, interviewer, 
and Michael W. interviewee. Okay, so there's a committee in British Parliament, one part of their parliament, their government, is called the House of Lords, and they have a committee, and they're interviewing this man, uh, I guess his name is W., and his last name is Michael. I, I don't know why it would be the other way. And they're interviewing this guy in 1819. Okay, I wonder what this guy has to say. Why is the government interviewing him? Well, they want to find out if factories are safe or not. So let's see what he says. Michael Ward was a doctor in Manchester for 30 years. This is at the top. His practice treated several children who worked in Manchester factories. He was interviewed about the health of textile factory workers on March 25th, 1819 by the House of Lords Committee. The exchange below is an excerpt, meaning just part, from the interview. Okay, so this guy's a doctor. He's a doctor in Manchester, one of the biggest cities in England, and he treats children who work in those factories. So let's see what he's going to say to this committee that, again, is represented by the government. Question. Give the committee information on your knowledge of the health of workers in cotton factories. So they want to know, okay, what's the health of workers in these factories? He answers, I have had frequent opportunities of seeing people coming out from the factories and occasionally attending as patients. Last summer, I visited three cotton factories with Dr. Clough in Preston, sorry, of Preston, and Mr. Barker of Manchester, and we could not remain 10 minutes in the factory without gasping for breath. Ooh. Question. What was your opinion of the relative state of health between cotton factory children and children in other employment, in, in other words, other jobs. How do those kids compare to people work, kids working in other jobs? He answers, the state of the health of the cotton factory children is much worse than that of children employed in other manufacturers. So he says it quite clearly. The doctor says, kids who work in these textile factories have worse health than kids who work in other jobs. Okay, keep reading. Question, have you any further information to give the committee? Answer, cotton factories are highly unfavorable, both to the health and morals of those employed in them. They are really nurseries of disease and vice. So what he's saying there is these factories are not healthy. They're not safe. It's not good for the people that are there. He says there are nurseries of disease and vice. Think about a nursery, whether it's for plants or for babies. The whole point is to let things grow, let the, the plants grow or to let the children grow. Well, he says these are just nurseries of disease and vice. In other words, the only thing that grows in there is disease and bad things. Question, have you observed that children in the factory have particular accidents? Answer, when I was a surgeon in the infirmary, Accidents were very often admitted to the infirmary through the children's hands and arms having been caught in the machinery. Oh, boy. In many instances, the muscles and the skin stripped down to the bone. Oh, my God. And in some instances, a finger or two might be lost. Last summer, I visited Lever Street School. The number of children at that time in the school who were employed in the factories was 106. The number of children who had received injuries from the machinery amounted to very nearly one half. There were 47 injured in this way. Okay, so what is he saying there? He's saying, I can't tell you how many kids get in accidents at these factories, whether it's having their hands and arms being caught in the machinery, losing a finger, having their skin stripped down to the bone. I saw lots of kids who had accidents there. Yeah, kids should not be around heavy machinery. Um, when I was about your age, I guess a little bit older, I was about 14, I remember I worked at a supermarket and there was a trash compactor. For those of you who don't know, a trash compactor takes garbage and it crushes it so it doesn't take up as much space so you could fit more in. Um, I was allowed to throw things in the garbage, but older people, not myself, people 16 and older, only they were allowed to take it, the garbage, and put it in the compactor, I couldn't even put it in there, and then hit the button that actually crushed the garbage. I wasn't even allowed to go near that. That's because kids like this were, I know it's another country, but kids like this were getting caught in the machinery and they were having accidents, and that's not good. Um, so based on this document, were these factories 
good for the health of English workers and children? Absolutely not. Now, it's children mostly that they focus on, but it doesn't sound good for anybody. I mean, if children can't breathe, adults can't breathe. So that is not good. But that's just one document. So let's take a look at document B. Go to the bottom, House of Lords Committee again, interviewer, and the interviewee, E. Holmes, from a year before, 1818. All right, so this is before the interview we just had, and it's with a different person. Let's read. Edward Holm was a physician who lived in Manchester, England during the first half of the 19th century. He was an active member of various academic societies and associations and a well-regarded doctor. In 1818, he was interviewed by the House of Lords Committee about health conditions of factories. The exchange below is from that interview. So just like the last one, this is a different doctor, but a year before. Let's see what he says. Question. How long have you practiced as a physician? That's a fancy word for a medical doctor in Manchester. He says 24 years. Question. Has that given you opportunities of observing the state of the children who are ordinarily employed in the cotton factories? Answer. It has. Question. In what state of health did you find the persons employed? Answer. They were in good health generally. I can give you particulars, if desired, of Mr. Pooley's factory. He employs 401 persons, and of the, 20, of the persons examined in 1796, 22 were found to be of delicate appearances. Two were entered as sickly, three in bad health, and one subject to convulsions. Those are like seizures. Eight cases of scrofula, that's tuberculosis, in good health, 363. Okay, so what he's saying there is 22 people were found... Uh, or I guess it's a little more than that, were found to be compromised, meaning they weren't in their best health when they went into the factory. When they say of delicate appearances, it means like the kid's fragile, the kid is not strong, maybe a little bit weak. Uh, sickly, you know what that means, bad health, subject to convulsions, might have had tuberculosis. So he says the rest were in good health. Okay. Question, and I, am I to understand you from your un investigations in 1796 you formed a rather favorable opinion of the health of persons employed in cotton factories. Answer, yes. So what they're asking him is, you view factories positively ever since you've seen them back in 1796. And this Dr. Holmes says, yes, I view factories favorably. Question, have you had any occasion to change that opinion since? Answer, none whatever. They are as healthy as any other part of the working classes of the community. Question. Who applied you to undertake the examinings of these children in Mr. Pooley's factory? Answer. Mr. Pooley. Okay, wait a second. That's important. Because this doctor is saying, no, there's no problem with the children in this factory. They're all healthy. And if they weren't healthy, they, uh, you know, they weren't healthy going in. So they weren't going to be healthy coming out. But then they ask, well, who asked you to investigate these kids at the factory? And he says, Mr. Pooley. Well, Mr. Pooley's the factory owner. Does that sound a little shady to you? I mean, I, I'm just guessing. Maybe the factory owner is saying to this doctor, hey, make it sound like this place is not unhealthy and I'll pay you. I'll pay you to use your medical standing as a doctor you know, to use your license essentially to say, no, it's perfectly healthy. I'm a qualified doctor and I'll pay you to say that. I have a funny feeling that that's the case here. Do I know that as a fact? No, I don't. But the evidence suggests that that's possible. If Mr. Pooley, the factory owner, pays Dr. Holmes to investigate the children, to examine the children there, there's a chance that he said, look, make sure these kids pass and here's some extra money to do that. So I, I don't know that I can really take Dr. Holmes' word um, for it. You know, we don't know if this guy was compromised. We don't know if this guy's telling the truth. Only based on that, that suggestion that maybe he's not. Otherwise, you know, I'd probably believe him. But, you know, if he's being paid by the factory owner, he could be lying. Maybe the factory owner is paying him to get the government off the factory owner's back, to leave it alone. We don't know, but it's suggested. 
Let's go to document C, John Burley. Go to the bottom, J. Burley, 19th of May, 1849, the Ashton Chronicle. All right, so this is in 1849. This is in the middle of that century. John Burley was born in London in 1805. He lost both his parents by the age of five, and he was sent to, excuse me, Bethnal Green Workhouse. So that means he was an orphan, and he was sent to this workhouse, this factory. He soon began working at the Crestbrook factory. John was interviewed about his experiences as a child worker at the mill in 1849. An article on his life was published in the newspaper, the Ashton Chronicle, in May 1849. Below is an excerpt or a piece from the article. So this is a guy who's an adult at the time that this article comes out, but they are going back to his childhood. So it is a primary source because he was there. He's telling you about his life. There's just one problem. Because it was so long ago, his memory might have changed. It's not perfect. Everybody has biases. Your mind is not a video recorder. You don't remember things exactly as they happened. You add bias to it. Things change as you watch it so or as you recall things. So just keep that in mind while John Burley talks about it. I have every reason to believe him, but I take it with a grain of salt, meaning I understand that he might be stretching the truth just because it was so long ago. Okay, read with me. Our regular working time was from 5 in the morning till 9 or 10 at night. Ooh, can you imagine? And on Saturday till 11 and often 12 o'clock at night, and then we were sent to clean the machinery on Sunday. Oh my gosh. No time was allowed for breakfast and no sitting for dinner and no time for tea. We went to the mill at 5 o'clock and worked till about 8 or 9 when they brought us our breakfast, which consisted of water porridge with oat cake in it and onions to flavor it. We were then worked till 9 or 10 at night. Wow. So he's saying, look, we were just given porridge, oat cake, and onions. That's not a great combination. Um, that's what we were given to eat so we could work. And we worked until about 8 or 9 at night some nights, sometimes till midnight. Wow. I mean, that's tough for me, and I'm 30, 40 years old. These are kids. Crazy. Let's keep reading. Second paragraph. Mr. Needham, the master, had five sons. Frank, Charles, Samuel, Robert, and John. The sons had a man named Swan, the overlooker, used to go up and down the mill with sticks. Frank once beat me till he frightened himself. He thought he had killed me. He had struck me on the temples, that's on the side of your head, and knocked me dateless. He once knocked me down and threatened me with a stick. To save my head, I raised my arm, which he then hit with all his might. My elbow was broken. I bear the marks and suffer the pain from it to this day and shall, and always shall as long as I live. Wow. Well, this just sounds like a wonderful experience. Um, guys, you know, we said, is it bad for the health of English workers? So far, we have these people working crazy hours. They're only being fed water porridge, oat cake, and onions, only carbohydrates, no proteins or fats. And then it says in this paragraph, uh, yeah, a couple of the sons would uh, beat us mercilessly, um, you know, in the head, uh, on the elbow. This doesn't sound healthy at all. This doesn't sound like it was good for the health of English workers whatsoever. Let's keep reading. I was determined to let the gentlemen of Bethnal Green Parish know the treatment we had, and I wrote a letter and put it into the post office. Sometime after this three gentlemen came down from London. But before we were examined, we were washed and cleaned up and ordered to tell them we liked working at the mill and we were well treated. Aha, so basically these kids were threatened to say that they liked working at the mill and they liked the way they were treated. Okay. Needham and his sons were in the room at the time. They asked us questions about our treatment, which we answered as we had been told, not daring to do any other knowing what would happen if we told them the truth. So these kids are scared into lying. And we've all seen movies and TV shows where that happens. Maybe that you've even seen that in your life. Maybe that happened to you. Maybe you lied because you were afraid of telling the truth based on the recourse, based on what might happen to you. Based on document C, this was not good for the health of English workers, these children in particular. All right, let's look at one last document. Go to the bottom. E. Baines, 1835. 
History of the Cotton Manufacture in Great Britain. So this is in 1835. Let's find out who E. Baines is. Edward Baines was a newspaper journalist and editor for the Leeds Mercury newspaper. In the 1830s, he was elected to Parliament. Okay, so he was elected to be in their government and served there as a political liberal, meaning he's more left-wing than right-wing. He's more liberal than conservative. Although Bain supported the end of slavery and various political reforms, he opposed legislation regulating factories and extended voting rights to the English working class. These are excerpts from his book, History of the Cotton Manufacture in Great Britain. Okay, so this is from a book he writes. Even though he was against slavery and had other political reforms to make society better, it says he opposed legislation, meaning laws, that would regulate the factories, meaning he opposed putting more rules on these factories. Um, that's interesting. That means that this guy thought, no, you can leave the factories the way that they are, and you don't have to change anything. So just keep that in mind as you read this. All right. Above all, it is alleged, meaning it's accused, that the children who labor in mills are often cruelly beaten by overlookers, that their feeble limbs, that means they're like brittle, weak limbs, become distorted by continual standing and stooping, that in many mills they are forced to work 13 or 14 or 15 hours per day, and that they have not time to either play or for education. So he's saying, look, the accusation against these factories is that these kids are beaten often, that they're beaten into submission, and that they're working too long, and they can't play, which is what children should do, and they can't be educated, which everyone should do. Factory inspectors who have visited nearly every mill in the factory have proved that views mentioned above in, of labor in factory mills contain a very small portion of truth. It is definitely true that there have been instances of abuse and cruelty in some factories, but abuse is the exception, not the rule. Factory labor is far less injurious than many of the most common jobs of civilized life. So he says it there in that second paragraph. Yeah, well, look, some people have been beaten, and, you know, some of these conditions are bad, but that's the exception, not the rule. In other words, saying most factories aren't like that. Only a few factories are like that, but most factories are not like that. Okay, keep reading. The human frame is liable to an endless variety of diseases. Many of the children who are born into the world and attain the age of 10 or 12 years are so weak that under any circumstances, they would die early. Such children would sink under factory labor as they would under any other kind of labor, even or even without labor. All right. We know that what that paragraph said is not true because you guys are all about 11, 12 years old, maybe close to 13, and he just said that some kids are so weak that they're going to die anyway. Well, you know, I met you guys. You guys all seem like healthy young kids despite this pandemic. Um, you're not brittle. You're not frail. You go to school. Your parents feed you, you have time to play, you have time to learn, you go to a safe work environment. That's why you guys aren't dying rapidly. But this guy says, oh yeah, 12 year olds, they're, they're, they're fragile, they're so weak, they're, you know, that they, they would die no matter what you did with them. Well, that's just not true. Um, you know, I, I question why he says that, but that's what he says. Keep reading. I am not saying that factories are the most agreeable and healthy places. Okay, well, he just said it right there. He said, I am not saying that factories are the most agreeable, meaning pleasant and healthy places. Yeah, he's saying they're not great. They're not that healthy. They're not satisfactory. Or that there have not been abuses in them, which required exposure and correction. It must be admitted that the hours of labor in cotton mills are long, being 12 hours a day on five days a week and nine hours on Saturday, but the work is light and requires very little muscular exertion. So his point is, hey, you don't got to work yourself that hard when you're there. Yeah, you're there for a while, but you don't have to work yourself that hard. Hey, how many of you uh, come to school for seven hours, only seven hours, not the 12 hours a day that they mention here, and by the end of the day, you're like, oh, I'm so tired. I don't want to do this anymore. 
Well, according to this guy, you should never complain because you're not exerting yourself other than P.E. Uh, or Jim, you're not exerting yourself. So this guy says, oh, no, it's okay. It's, it's light. It requires very little muscular exertion. They're not exerting themselves. It is scarcely possible for any job to be lighter. The position of the body is not injurious. The children walk about and have opportunity to sit down frequently if they want to. On visiting mills, I have noticed the coolness and calmness of the work people, even of the children, whose attitudes are positive and not anxious or gloomy. Um, I don't think he's doing a very good job of talking to those kids, though, because as we just interviewed somebody in the last document, he said, yeah, we were told to lie. You know, Now, look, people who are in bad conditions, they're not crying the whole time. You know, People who were slaves, they would laugh and tell jokes and sing and dance. That doesn't mean that they were happy with being slaves. You know, they just were trying to make the most of it. These kids were probably trying to make the most of it. But if you ask this guy, he says, nah, the factories aren't that bad. Sure, there's some bad things, but really, they're not all bad. Uh, that's his opinion. So here's what I want you to do. Based on those four documents, what do you think? Were these factories bad for the health of English workers, particularly these children? What do you think based on these four documents? Now, in 10 to 15 sentences, use information from the documents, a quote or something like that, and tell me what you think based on that, okay? That's pretty much it for this video, guys. If you have any questions, feel free to email me and log on to the Zoom Q&A. Um, any week is fine, and we'll talk about this next